let's go back to uh, telling a story. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, of course, cybersecurity. We're at a uh, security and privacy summit right now. But at the same time, there is also a larger... Um, are you guys able to hear me, by the way? I see uh, some people saying, I hear all this okay. Okay, good. So... <laughs> So there is a larger uh, context, of course, uh, with cybersecurity. I run a uh, cybersecurity company that is called Radically Open Security. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us already, we have a very weird uh, business model in that we actually give basically all of our profits to charity. So uh, we have this uh, yeah, business model sort of from the church. It's called a fiscal fundraising institution. Uh, churches sometimes do commercial spin-offs. They do some work of some kind, and then that money goes back to the church again. Uh, a famous example of this is the Language Institute Regina Chaley, otherwise known as the Nonnen van Fucht. And uh, basically, we decided to use this business model and to make our commercial spin-off a security consultancy company and our so-called church, the NLNet Foundation. But the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that um, when I first started Radically Open Security, the most obvious thing that one would do is to go to a business incubator. So uh, Radically Open Security was incubated at ACE, uh, the Amsterdam Center for Entrepreneurship. And of course, when I first uh, told people I wanted to start a not-for-profit business, uh, they all thought that... I was pretty crazy. <laughs> um, here's the thing. Um, when you go to startup incubators, and this is pretty much every startup incubator. So you could take, for example, uh, the Hague Security Delta as, a, uh, as an example. Um, we are taught that it is, we're supposed to use the Silicon Valley model, which is basically capital scale exit. That's always the way that it works. Um, what that means essentially is that we sort of have the impression that investment is necessary to start a business and also that selling our business at the end, this exit, that this is our definition of success. <laughs> um, however, certainly in the cybersecurity space, this is extremely problematic uh, for a few reasons. One particular uh, case uh, is, um, like, like, for example, we are building things like um, monitoring uh, boxes that we're putting into uh, people's networks. Um, and, you know, there, there's one case that I talk about sometimes just because it's a bit of an obvious one in the Netherlands. But Fox IT, for example, uh, made some monitoring boxes. They were in the government in the businesses and also, um, you know, uh, the military. Um, what wound up happening was uh, when the company was acquired, basically, um, a lot of people in the government and big in, in the business area were like, you know, oh, crap, you know, our data now belongs to the British. Now, what happened is there was another spinoff from Fox IT that was called Red Sox, which also made these great you know, monitoring black boxes and they had investors, right? <laughs> you know, and they grow, grew exponentially. And then of course, sure enough, two years later, I read the press release, congratulations to Red Sox. They're just acquired by the Romanians, you know? And then we're back at square one, you know, <laughs> sort of wondering like, you know, will we ever learn? <laughs> you know, it turns out that there are actually business models that can prevent these kinds of data governance problems from happening. One particular one is called uh, steward ownership. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, well, many of you here are familiar with it, but it is actually the concept of starting a company that is impossible to sell. Now, this is uh, not the kind of thing that you're typically going to learn from most business incubators, but the way that it works, there's a couple different form entity forms that you can use for structuring your company. The first is uh, what I would call really just, you know, nonprofit business form. So things like foundation ownership of companies, right? So, uh, you know, radically open security is one um, example of this. Uh, there's a foundation that owns 100% of the shares of my company. And there's also some boards that are there to block any eventual sale of my company. 
Other steward-owned companies uh, also have uh, what's called a poison pill construction. So they have, for example, a golden share that may be held by third-party entities such as the uh, Purpose Foundation uh, in Germany, which is one of the main uh, or, you know, organizations behind steward ownership. And really, the, ho the whole purpose of this is to block the eventual sale of your company. <laughs> now, people would ask, why would you want to do this? <laughs> well, the reason why you would want to do this is because you're trying to actually pr protect the mission and the governance, you know, <laughs> uh, and also the, the governance of the data within that organization. And I would think that this is actually really interesting, for example, for governments. But Again, coming back to this whole Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship, the problem is that our startup ecosystem has turned into something of a casino, <laughs> you know, and by that, uh, what I mean is that um, it's well known that 90% of startups fail, right? So in a way, what we have is it's kind of like investors are buying 10 lottery tickets. Now they know that nine of these lottery tickets uh, are not gonna work out, they're gonna be losses. So it means that that one winning lottery ticket, that one startup that succeeds, it has to not just succeed modestly, but it has to knock it so far out of the park <laughs> that, um, you know, that it can basically make up for all of these other nine losses. So um, of course, if you stop and think about this, first of all, the fact that 90% of startups fail is already an indictment of the fact actually that the system isn't working. The other thing also is, is that with that 10% that uh, winds up succeeding, we are pressured essentially to become unicorns. Now, a unicorn is a uh, company with a so-called valuation of 1 billion US dollars. So um, a valuation, of course, is a bit of a, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a, a bit of an imagine, <laughs> imaginary kind of construction because the way that it works is you have the outstanding number of shares and then you have uh, the, basically the, the last amount that was paid by the most recent investors for the shares. So basically the number of outstanding shares times the cost per share is the valuation. That's pretty simple. However, um, Basecamp at one point had put out a satirical blog post and they said, you know, in, in their blog post that uh, we have now sold one billionth of a share for one US dollar. So, you know, congratulations us, you know, you know, we're now worth, you know, a, a billion dollars. Yay, we're a unicorn. <laughs> you know, I mean, clearly this was a, satirical blog post and and it was quite funny but the truth is that it actually works this way <laughs> um there are um vcs that have deliberately paid really large amounts of money for very very small numbers of shares with the express purpose of uh artificially inflating the valuation uh this of course then enables other companies to be able to um sell it or, or otherwise, you know. But the problem with these unicorns, and not a lot of people know this, is that 90% um, of unicorns um, are in the red. And I don't mean 90% 90, 90 of unicorns that are up and coming, but I mean 90% of all unicorns, including the unicorns that have been around for a very long time. So only 10% of them actually ever get out of the red uh, numbers. And this is, you know, and, and the unicorns are the success stories. So what this means is you have this inherently revenue losing company. I mean, WeWork is the most famous example because it was bleeding money five times faster than it was getting it from customers. Um, but, you know, in the security industry, it's exactly the same if we look at large security companies like Palantir. <laughs> Palantir was actually really quite interesting because it had uh, opened uh, basically its books for the very first time during its filings for the IPO. And actually what we found is first of all, that it was very, very, very deeply in the red. I mean, losing, you know, <laughs> uh, really tens of millions per year 
first of all. The second thing also was that uh, the amount of money that it was actually putting into its marketing budget was considerably larger than the amount of money that it was even putting into its R&D budget. So, you know, and, and there's some really good articles, if you Google it, that we're sort of um, talking about. But the point is that actually whether or not a business is making money or is losing money is actually kind of besides the point. <laughs> um, because, you know, the, these businesses are being propped up artificially by this, you know, investment capital. <laughs> so, the problem, though, is you have this inherently revenue losing thing, right? And it's getting, you know, it's sort of like what we would call uh, a battery chicken or in Dutch, we call it a plof kip, right? <laughs> so you're artificially stuffing, you know, force feeding these, you know, startups with this investment capital. So it outwardly looks successful right? So they're hiring people, they're spending a lot on advertising, they're getting large offices, you know, but of course it's not, customer revenue is not keeping up anywhere near this. Now the problem is, you know, this gets hyped in the media and it's essentially a pump and dump scheme onto the public markets. <laughs> um, now what happens is that, um, People then during the IPO will buy these companies uh, because of something called the greater fool theory. So uh, what this means is that it, it doesn't actually matter what you're selling as long as there is some greater fool who is willing to pay more than you did, did you know, for this particular asset. Uh, and, and it's not just with uh, IPOs, it's with the stock market in general, it's with crypt cryptocurrencies, it's with tulips, take your pick. You know, but the point is this works in a growth economy, but the moment that the economy flattens out or worse yet, uh, if we get into a recession, it's always the last investor that is left holding the bag, which basically means that, uh, you know, and the problem is, of course, um, you know, another question that people don't ask often enough is with these revenue losing unicorns, whose money are they spending? Now, if you look at the typical VC fund, um, for example, in the United States, 65% uh, uh, of the cash that is going into these VC funds comes from pension funds. So what that means is people like you and me, we want to retire someday. Right. <laughs> but the problem is that the pension funds right now are in an extremely desperate situation because of the low interest rates. So um, what happens is that uh, what used to be safe investments, things like, uh, you know, interest on bank accounts or, or bonds, you know, which used to give returns, these things now are worthless or, you know, in the case of uh, bank accounts, I mean, there's negative interest, you're, they're actively losing money. So this is the reason why pension funds are actively moving over to so-called riskier asset classes like VC, because they're trying to get the returns to keep the promises to people like you and me that we actually really someday can retire. However, <laughs> uh, another thing that people also don't realize is that 85% of VC funds over the last 25 years, uh, given the historical performance of the stock market, have failed to even keep, you know, keep pace you know, with the stock market. So what that means is literally if 25 years ago you had bought an index fund and held it, <laughs> you would have done better than 85% of the VC funds. So what the VCs are actually saying with like, you know, 10X, 18X, you know, all, all of these promises, they're actually promises that they're not able to keep, you know? So, as, you know, as taxpayers, as citizens, we're, we're getting it on the front, you know? I mean, also these pension funds and also investment funds are also buying, you know, these, uh, these stocks also on the back end after the IPO. So we're also getting it on the back and, you know, on top of this, 90% of startups are failing. <laughs> and, and we also don't consider that what is actually happening here as well is that when you are subsidizing revenue losing companies <laughs> into market dominance, that first of all um, is monopoly forming. <laughs> it's taxpayer subsidized monopoly forming. And second of all, it is deforming basic market economics of entire industries, causing these industries to actually evolve and grow 
incorrectly <laughs> because those companies that actually do have solid business models and are bootstrapped, it's really hard. Like for example, with, uh, with my company, Radically Open Security, I actually have to pay my staff from customer revenue, right? <laughs> you know, and it's really hard, I think, to, um, to be able to pay uh, folks, you know, more than some other company that anyway is bleeding money and doesn't actually have to uh, live from such things as solid business models. Now, the point that I'm really trying to make here is that this whole uh, system is really set up in such a way that it's actually not even about security, <laughs> right? So um, in terms of security, we are fighting the cybercrime ecosystem. And the cybercrime ecosystem is uh, collaborative. It is uh, working together. It is specialized, you know, but on the defender side, what's happening is we are stratified. We are in silos. And also for the sake of our business models, we are turning open source into freemium. So take things like, uh, you know, Nessus and Metasploit and Snort. I mean, so many previously open source projects uh, are converted into these freemium business models, just quite simply for the sake of, uh, you know, of, of basically the optics of being able to support this growth model. And this actually isn't even what we need because with cybersecurity, what we are trying to do really is you know the most successful uh, initiatives are always ones where we're open, where we're transparent, where we're collaborative, where we're sharing. You know, I mean, a lot of the uh, really large uh, malware uh, rings oftentimes are you know rolled up usually by several different organizations working together, and we don't necessarily need uh, companies that are building their own little proprietary wheels when actually what is more useful is building a smaller number of truly open source wheels that we can collaborate on and work on together. It's the same thing with threat feeds, because if you consider that something like antivirus, uh, you know, with antivirus, the engine itself is usually given away for free. But of course, the, the real revenue model for these things tends to be in the threat feeds. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the same time, of course, there is no value in the antivirus engine without the uh, the signatures without the threat feeds to be able to match against. But in a way, it's like we have this solution, but we'll only give it to you you know, if, uh, if, you know, if we sell it to you, if you give us money and it's like having the cure, but, but withholding it, you know, because of these commercial business models, there are alternatives, uh, like a Vost, which is also free, but then that works on a different business model of basically selling the data. So, you know, and of course that also has other privacy issues that also are not ideal. There are other ways, but like, for example, with, uh, the open source business model, um, the whole business model behind open source is really, you know, you give away the product, you sell the services. And it just so happens that in cybersecurity, you know, we are by and large also a, 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 you know, a services oriented industry and you can sell services <laughs> and build a really great viable business um, by selling services and giving away the product. There's other great Dutch startups also frequently in the uh, in the DevOps space, <laughs> such as uh, Elastic, for example, that also, I mean, you know, they, they can become really incredible, successful companies, you know, with a service based business model. The last thing that we also don't think about is with the open source business model, people say, yeah, but services aren't scalable. You know, I'll also remind you that we're also in a moment when, you know, we're, we have the platform economy. So, you know, and, and we have these platforms, you know, the Ubers and the Airbnbs, you know, that are facilitating basically uh, work that's being done between producers and consumers. Tell me again how services are not scalable. <laughs> so the point that I'm really trying to make is there are very few places that you can go in our startup ecosystem to teach you these kinds of ideas. If you want to bootstrap instead of going with investors, if you want to build a steward owned company, you know, or a not for profit company, instead of uh, building a company that is, is really built, you know, for the exit built to be sold, uh, you know, companies that 
work that that are trying to have flat growth models rather than exponential growth models you know if we're really trying to optimize for social value then the best thing that we can do also with our cybersecurity companies is to take a step back away from this whole silicon valley model <laughs> and instead ask ourselves the question how can i use my company as a tool for activism yeah <laughs> how can i use my my company as as a mixed media for art or a ve vehicle for spirituality or even you know as a means of creative expression so this is, I think, the last idea that I would like to leave you all with. Remember that when you are starting your cybersecurity companies, there are more models you know, than what is being presented to us by the commercial incubators. And those models that also we are being presented, they in themselves are also threats that we need to be able to contend with. So, Melanie, um, uh, we have one question. Yes. Uh, isn't this the same with the bad guys? Do they share their information and tools? They also want to make money, don't they? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're, uh, I think that uh, they, they do have a service-based economy. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see a whole lot of criminal organizations IPOing on the, uh, on the stock market unless they have some kind of, some form of stock market that I'm not familiar with. Okay. Well, uh, we, we still have five minutes, so, uh, oh, there's another question. Where mm -hmm. can we find more info uh, uh, on company models also valid in the rest of Europe, like Belgium? Sure. Um, I think that, uh, I'm not sure specifically about Belgium, but uh, there is a, there's a nice thing called the Peer-to-Peer uh, -peer Foundation, and they have a wiki. And in their wiki, they uh, have an they have a huge taxonomy actually of different social business structures. So um, it, it's rather comprehensive. So I would first say uh, have a look at that. But I think if you also just Google uh, or DuckDuckGo um, uh, Social Enterprise Belgium or Steward Ownership Belgium, I can't speak for Belgium, but I know in the Netherlands that we do have uh, local organizations. In the Netherlands, we have We Are Stewards, uh, for example. Uh, also, you know, I'm running an incubator now myself, I uh, have been for about three years. It's also called Nonprofit Ventures. Uh, we actually also have a uh, call for applications. It's actually a free program uh, for people to, uh, to participate in. So uh, we're basically just doing it to spread awareness of nonprofit business models. But um, yeah, so I mean, there are uh, resources uh, that are out there if you look for them. Okay, great. Well, uh, you, uh, although we had some problems in the, at the start, but you had a very complete story. And uh, I can say I can thank you for all of us for your great information, Melanie. And uh, I'll hope you also be able to enjoy the rest of the show. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Okay, guys, next back to the lobby and go to your next session.